oops, forgot to add myself to the stream. Sorry for that slight pregnant pause. So, sorry, I've got a, my desk is such a mess. I'm really sorry. You can't see what's going on down here, but trust me, it's filthy. Hello, happy Wednesday. I hope you are doing well. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are coming from, from the world. As always, if you've been here before, you know I'm the first thing I'm going to do is ask you to please just type a little hello so I know that there's actually somebody there and I'm not just this crazy English woman sat in her front room of her home wearing reindeer hat tinsel and talking to herself. So obviously that wouldn't be the first time that that's ever happened because I do do that. But if you could just let me know that you're there, I would really appreciate it. So just a quick, hello, Gigi, how you doing? Or nice um, antlers, Gigi, you look cool. Something like, I mean, clearly I don't look cool, but something along those lines would be great. Ah, we've got Thomas from Florid. I think you might have missed an A off there. Florida. Thank you. I'm glad you like my outfit, Thomas. I appreciate that. Um, oh, I've got a bit of wire on it. Mm, strange. And who else do we have? We have E from Germany. So, oh, good evening. I, I can't remember what good evening is in German. I was going to say good Nacht, but then, then I'd be saying good night to you, wouldn't I? And you'd be off to bed. You're only an hour ahead of me, so it's only 6.30. That'd be a bit early for bedtime. Although I have been known to go to bed at 6.30. To be fair, I do love my sleep. Who else do we have? Please say hello. There's a few more of you that have arrived. Okay, so, ah, guten Abend. Have I got that right? Have I pronounced it? Okay. Guten, guten Abend. All right. I'll practice that one. I'd love to learn German. My children don't get to learn German at school. It's French or Spanish. And I know a little bit of both of them, but I know very little German. Very cool language. I seem to be losing people talking about German. Sorry, E. It's very cool. And if they don't know that, then shame on them. Okay. We've got Stephanie. Hello, Stephanie. Welcome. Welcome. How are you doing? Where are you arriving from? I would love to know. It's very quiet. It's been very quiet this week. I don't know if things are, are things ramping down where you are and where you work, but it has been very quiet this week. All right. Oh, hello, Ashu. Welcome. You love my work. That's so sweet. I really appreciate that. That's very kind. Okay. So whilst we have people arriving, oh, we've got Gulkin. Would that be right? Have I pronounced that right? Gulkin from Turkey. Wonderful. Eric, you were from Florida. Oh, we've got Thomas from Florida and Eric from Florida. Very nice. Well done, the Florida contingent. I don't know why I keep looking at this. This is my light. And for some reason, I'm looking at my light rather than looking at my camera. So apologies if my eye line is all over the place. And uh, Gulchin. Ah, oh, okay. It's a ch, ch. Got it. Great. Oh, and Stephanie's in the Bay Area. Very cool. Very cool. Right. So... It's all a bit quiet in the world at the moment. So I'm just going to get going and whoever shows up, shows up and whoever doesn't, everything is kind of ramping down as far as Amazon interviews are concerned, but you're here and therefore you need my help, I assume. And therefore that's what I'm going to do. My raison d'etre is to help you. So quick introduction. I am cradling a cup of tea. Oh, I've just, <laughs> it's just a big brand plug for kitty care. And today's episode is sponsored by Kitty Care. No, I promise you, today's episode is not sponsored by Kitty Care. I got like six mugs when I bought some stuff for my children, my youngest, who's now 14. So this mug is at least 14 years old. <laughs> anyway, so I'm cold. So I'm cradling a cup of tea as any good English woman would. So I am Gigi and I'm the Amazon Wiz. As you know, because you've joined me from my YouTube channel, I worked at Amazon for many years. I was a um, L7 senior leader, hiring manager, and most usefully for you, I was a bar raiser. Now, I know you'll be finding tons of content out there on YouTube and bless you, you've made the very sensible decision to listen to my content because uh, it is the best. <laughs> <laughs> of course it is. Um, so the difference between me and all of the other stuff that you'll see out there from L5 product managers to L6 recruiters, etc., is when you're an interviewer at Amazon or a hiring manager, you're really only going to be interviewing around your own sphere, either for your own team or maybe for some adjacent teams. So you get a very limited perspective on the whole process. 
If you're a recruiter, you're only either recruiting within your own team or you are hiring on behalf of somebody else for a particular skill set. So recruiters in Amazon will be dedicated to particular types of job families. So, for example, they recruit software development engineers or they recruit brand managers, etc. So they only get a very limited perspective on the world. Oh, and they probably only recruit within a single country as well. Maybe not so, but the majority. The Amazon interview process has huge range and diversity. It it kind of sounds like on the outside that it's one process. It's not. There are many divergences. Uh, (laughs) Samesh, hey, Samesh, you like my antlers. Um, And what you get as a bar raiser is the opportunity to interview across all different job families. I have interviewed across dozens of different job families. You also get to interview across all levels. So I would have interviewed from L4s all the way up to L8s, which are directors. You get to interview across different countries. So I've done different countries, UK, Germany, France, Spain, Italy, Japan, Mexico, Canada, North America, obviously. I think I did an Australia one once, all sorts of countries around the world. And you um, can interview on tech or non-tech. So you get this very, very broad perspective of the interview process that other people who are not barres, barrisers, do not get. I know exactly what it takes to get hired at Amazon, and I have personally given the approval to hire hundreds of Amazonians. In my time there, it became very obvious to me who had had specialist coaching and who hadn't. They knew what to say. They knew what to do. They really understood leadership principles, blah, 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 blah. I got curious as any good Amazonian would and looked into what that type of training costs and found out that kind of on a one-to-one basis, you're looking at probably a minimum, at least in the Western hemisphere, $200 an hour, anything up to $750 an hour and other people are charging thousands of dollars for courses, et cetera. I felt that that was exclusive and out of the range of many people. I know even as an L7, I would have balked at paying $750 for an hour to talk to somebody and that I could use digital to make it more accessible. So I created my YouTube channel. And then when I left Amazon, I set up my own digital academy where you can buy digital courses, 10 hours that will tell you absolutely everything you need to know to get hired at Amazon. And many of my candidates, I don't like to call them clients. I don't know why, but many of my candidates have done so. So I'm going to give you a freebie at the end of this session of my digital courses. So do not go anywhere and you'll get that at the end. Okay, so as part of my inclusive goals, I want to make sure that my type of expertise is available to as many people as possible. I offer these free sessions where you can come, you can ask me any question you like, and I will attempt to answer it. So that's what we're going to do today. What I will also be doing today is a little bit of a topic. Um, I asked for some feedback a long t- a while ago, and people said they wanted a topic at the beginning of these sessions. So I'm going to start with a topic. Right. So let's go with my topic. And what I'm going to be doing is toggling between my streaming platform and YouTube. So I'm hoping this will work because I've never tried doing this before. So let's have a go. So we're going to talk now about your examples and how far back in time you should use for your examples for your Amazon interview. So I've set up a little poll here on YouTube. I'm going to give it a go. Don't know if it'll work but I'm gonna ask you to vote on how far back in time. See, I did it again. I was looking at the light again. I don't know what's wrong, it's like a moth. Like, ooh, the light, the light. (laughs) How far back in time you should go, okay? So let's see if this works. Okay, ask my community. Right. So did you get a poll? I can't see anything showing on YouTube. Are you seeing a poll, people? Please let me know. Oh, there it is. All right, so vote. Please vote. How far back in time do you think you should go with your answers? I have no idea how this whole thing works. I don't even know how I see the answer. Oh, I make it bigger like that. Okay. Oh, we're voting. We're voting. Good, good, good. I can see the numbers climbing. I can see the numbers climbing. Okay. We're in a race. We've got head to head for the old up to two years and as far back as you like and 60% of up to four years. Okay. Okay. All right, so I'm going to end the poll there because there's only a few of you here today, which is a bit sad, but I appreciate you. We're going to end the poll. And most people are saying up to four years. 60% of you are saying up to four years. 20 of you are saying up to two years. And then 20% of you are saying as far back as you like. Okay, so I'm ending the poll. Okay, so... Of course, there is no one single answer to this. There's no law written in the um, 
10 commandment laws of Amazon. Oh, there you go. It pops up there. How clever. Oh, that worked. I'm impressed. There are no laws. There's nothing in the Amazon making great hiring decisions training that tells an interviewer that they must insist that candidates only give answers back X far. But there is best practice. And in my opinion, best practice is really that you don't have your examples going back much more than three to four years. So well done. The majority of you, you did get that right. And let me tell you why, because obviously, if you hear my um, explanation for something, you're going to want to know why I have this particular opinion. So two key reasons really why you shouldn't be aiming for much more than three to four years. The first is around the complexity of the answers that you give. So one of the biggest reasons why candidates fail their Amazon interview, and I'm sure you've heard me say this many times over if you are a frequent flyer with me. One of the main reasons is that they do not use examples that show the complexity that matches the role that they are applying for. And if a candidate can't show that they're capable of managing the type of complexity for the role that they're applying for, then the hiring manager isn't going to have confidence that they're going to be bar raising. And the problem is for most of us, now this changes obviously the further you get into your career and the longer your career tenure is. But for the majority of us, roles that we did say four years ago are more junior than the roles that we are applying for now. So what then happens if you're pulling in examples from those jobs that are much that are more junior than the role that you're applying for, they don't have the same level of complexity as the role that you are applying for at Amazon. Now, it isn't a complete veto, and I'm not saying that do not use any examples whatsoever that are over four years, but what you need to do is look at the balance, the mix of the examples that you're bringing to the table and try and make sure that the majority of your examples come, in my point of view, in the past four years. And that's from a complexity point of view. The second reason then where I say that is Amazon has a philosophy that behavior of the past is a predictor of behavior in the future. And the more recently you demonstrated that behavior, the more confidence that your manager and your interview panel are going to have in believing that you are then likely to execute that behavior if you landed in their business. So if I was able to talk to them and demonstrate to them, excellent, let's just choose dive deep. And my example came from six months ago, then they're going to go, well, that was really quite recent. Gigi's demonstrating strong dive deep. And we have confidence that when she comes into our business in in my country, it would be three months. But I know in the US, it's probably much shorter than that. Not too sure about other countries. I have high confidence that she demonstrated it relatively recently. So when she comes in, she'll demonstrate it here. As opposed to if I gave them the majority of my examples from, say, five, six years ago, they're going to say, well, why isn't Gigi able to demonstrate to me dive deep in the recent past? She's having to go all the way back to examples four years ago, five years ago, to be able to demonstrate that. Now I have lower confidence that if I brought Gigi into my organization tomorrow, that that demonstration of dive deep that she only seemed to be able to deliver four or five years ago is actually going to happen tomorrow. So that's the second thing in terms of why I say you want to really be aiming to have examples that come in in the last four years or so. Now, as I say, it doesn't mean to say that you can never use examples older than that. I used a 10 year old example in my interview at Amazon with the VP of my organization because it was such a such a strong example that exemplified how I operate My example was when I was a very junior marketer and I basically was working alongside the CEO of British Telecom, which is the main incumbent teleco here in the UK. It's a global organization as well. So the narrative I felt was super strong about kind of the even when I was very junior, how I was able to operate. So I used that example and clearly I got into Amazon. So I'm not saying don't use examples that are old, but. If you are going to use them, they have to be super, super powerful, really, really strong examples of that leadership principle. And don't use too many of them. Okay, so that's that. I hope that was useful. What I'm going to do now is thank you for doing the poll. That worked out okay. 
Oh, we're a very small group today. Oh, I don't know if I'm going to do next week now. Okay, let's get going. You're here. I'm here. Let's see if I can help you and answer your questions. So I'm now going to pick up some questions. So if you have questions, do bang them down now. I will ask, please don't ask me general things. People often say, oh, I've got a senior technical recruiter interview tomorrow. Can you give me some tips? Yeah, sure. Like three and a half hours worth of them on my YouTube channel. Equally, if you're going to ask me a very specific question that's very particular to your job family and your process, might not be able to answer it. There are thousands of job families in Amazon and no one person could possibly know everything about all of them. So I try where I can, but sometimes I have to admit that it's beyond my ability to retain that amount of information. So let's get going. I will say hello to people as they arrive, assuming they arrive. So yeah, Sumesh, you're here. You like my antlers. Do you like, do you like the tinsel as well? You didn't mention the tinsel, Sumesh. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Mesh. Hey. Right. So if you've been working with the same organization for the last three to four years, all your story should revolve around that. If you possibly can, Smash, you know, if you can find enough examples from that organization to bring to your interviews, then I would suggest you do that. One of the challenges that you also need to balance with is the concept of scope. So Another reason why people fail their Amazon interview is their examples don't reflect the scope of the role that they're doing. So, you know, you, you all will know that in the role that you do, there will be multiple different elements that make up that role in its entirety, different types of tasks, I suppose, or projects that you do. So the other reason why people fail is they don't give enough breadth of examples across those different kind of task slash product areas. And then compared to the role that they're applying for at Amazon, the hiring manager says, mm, I'm not convinced that they could do all of the job because they weren't able to articulate the examples that show me the breadth of their capability. Scope. So just be cognizant that if you are, which I still think you should, sticking with your current employer for the three to four year kind of historical view, do be careful to make sure that within that you reflect a good scope of different types of projects that you've done in that time. I hope that helps. Okay, Ashu, can you provide personal story for a few leadership skills? Of course, the priority is work-related experience. Ashu, it kind of depends on how experienced you are in your career. So if you are like me and you're very old and you've been working for 23 odd years, I would very much discourage you from using personal examples because someone like me should have enough experience in my career over the past four, or if I have to stretch to five or six years to be able to pretty much touch on, oh no, to be able to touch on all of the leadership principles, particularly at my level. If I was to not talk about my professional experiences in the context of the leadership principles, it would send up a red flag immediately to the interview panel who would be wondering why it is that I was incapable of coming up with a good answer from my career history for a particular leadership principle. And I had to default to something outside of work. That would be a red flag for them. And of course, they want the work context because They'll be worried about, well, if Gigi can show this in her personal life. Why is she failing to show it in her work life? Now, counter to that, if you are someone who's relatively early on in your career and you're quite junior, maybe you're only just out of college, university, whatever, or you've only had maybe a year or two years of experience, then that's more forgivable because you're not old like me and you don't have a huge backlog of experience to be able to pull from. So if you're in that side of the spectrum, then your interviewers will be uh, much more sympathetic about why it is you are unable to come up with a work related example and why you've had to default back to personal examples. Oh, who's phoning me? Oh, it's my brother. Honestly, I've got to get rid of him now. I've been trying to get hold of my brother for days and now he calls me. Honestly. Right. I hope he doesn't try again. Otherwise, I have to answer the phone. Sorry if I have to do that. Right. 
So I hope that is useful for you, Ashu. Let's move on to a next question. Ah, okay, E, you're a grad. Perfect example. Right, what else do we have? Well, at least he's left a voicemail. He never usually leaves voicemails. Okay, quick one here then. Hey, Mohammed. So it's the fifth working day and you still haven't heard back. Is it a bad sign? What should you do? Okay, so firstly, it is absolutely not a bad sign, even remotely. Um, so few candidates these days are actually having the SLA met of two and five. So few of them. You can see Amazon is recruiting recruiters left, right and center. And the recruiters that I'm still very much in touch with at Amazon are really Boeing under the pressure. They're growing so fast and they just can't recruit recruiters fast enough to keep up with the demand for recruiting non-recruiters. Say that when you've had a couple of drinks. So no, I wouldn't worry about that you're at day five. That said, I wouldn't suggest you just sit there and wait. It's always a good thing. And I always advocate for people to own their own process. So Mohammed, if you do have some contact details for your recruiter or for your recruiting coordinator, just ping them a very polite note back and say, we are at the five days. I'm super excited to hear the outcome. Obviously very, very keen on this role at Amazon. So would really appreciate an update on where we are at in terms of a result and leave it at that. If you don't get a response from that, I would try again in a couple of days. I have my fingers very tightly crossed for you. Hey, Thomas, how are you doing? Right, writing sample, fonts and spacing. Fonts, Calabri 11. I think I have that in my video. I have a video about the Amazon writing sample. My tea is not getting drunk. It's keeping me warm, but it's still getting drunk. I have a video about the Amazon writing sample. And I think I say in that video that you should use Calabri 11. Calabri 11 is the standard font used by Amazon and Amazonians when they're writing their WBRs, QBRs, working back with documents, PRFAQs, etc. So it's not going to, it's genuinely not going to make any difference to how they feel about the quality of your writing. But if you've got to pick something, you may as well just pick something that is very familiar to their eye. Again, I'm not for a second saying that the font that you use is going to be a determining factor in terms of the quality assessment they make of your content, but you've got to pick something. So you may as well pick Calabria 11 because they're just used to looking at it. In terms of spacing, again, you just want to be very standard, right? No squeezing up the margins, any of that nonsense. You've got two pages. Two pages should be plenty. And that's part of the challenge, Thomas. Can you tell your clear narrative in two pages. So I would suggest using the standard margins that word is predetermined to um, to throw up. That, that sounds horrible. That word is pre-programmed when you start a new document. So Calabria 11 and just use the standard uh, word margins and you'll be fine. I hope that helped. Okay. Ah, you're an academy member, Ashu. Hello, thank you. So you took my masterclass. Does scope and complexity can be derived from job description and resonate with past experience? So good question. I think scope can definitely be determined from the job description because basically your job description will tell you your responsibilities. There's always a section that literally details out your responsibilities. So what I tend to do and what I coach my candidates to do is to look at that responsibility section and the type of work that is um, defined in that responsibility section. And then to use that as a bit of a guide for picking examples from their career history. Because if you can have examples that connect to those different responsibilities, then your hiring manager is gonna go tick, I can see that they have executed the full scope of work that I'm looking for somebody to be able to do here. That scope. Complexity is a different thing. I don't think job descriptions, any job description I've ever read, Amazon or otherwise, 
has some has a mechanism to help you understand the complexity of the job. So I have my own little tricks for that one, which is what I do as a marketer, because that's what I was before I started doing this stuff, is I know the things that made my job complicated in marketing. So there were things like how many campaigns would I have to run a quarter, how big my team was, whether I was work, how many countries I was managing, how many languages I had to do my marketing in, how much budget I had, how many channels I managed, how many teams I had to interface with to be able to get my work done. All of those things drove the complexity of my roles. So whatever I do when I'm interviewing for myself and what I Uh, coach my candidates to do is to write that list of things that you know create complexity and then try and find out the answers to them so before the interview go to your recruiter they may not know the answers but they may be able to get them for you they'll probably say no to some if it's confidential but they might be able to get it for you or if you can't get the recruiter to do that then think about some of those key questions when you hit your first round of interviews so that if you are fortunate enough to make it through the first round and onto the subsequent rounds You've got that insight so you can then go back to your examples and try and make sure that they reflect that type of complexity. I hope that helps. Hmm. Hey, Thomas, do I have any sample of writings I could recommend reviewing? No, I don't. Leave that with me. I shall have a think about that, but I won't be able to turn anything around anytime soon, I don't think, Thomas, but thank you for the idea. Hey, E, are the two questions for the writing sample always the same and also for the role as graduate area manager? Okay, so E, I don't think that you get a writing sample test as a graduate area manager. You might correct me on that one, but... The standard process is that anybody who is an L6 or above is asked to do a writing sample. Uh, And that's because all major decisions made in Amazon are made based on a written document where everyone sits in a room, reviews the written document, talks about the written document, and then off a decision is made. Policy used to be, don't know if it's changed, haven't heard it's changed from any of my recruiting friends, Policy used to be only people whose role was very heavily focused on writing below an L6 would have to do a writing sample. So, for example, someone who was going to do a L5 product management job, because product management is all about writing documents and getting people to buy into your concept because you've written this fabulous document. L5 product managers have to do a writing sample. But I'm... Again, open to be corrected, but I don't think you as an L5 area manager should be being asked for a writing sample. If I am wrong about that, please do let me know because I want to make sure I have accurate and up-to-date information for my candidates. Oh, we've got 370 Kiran from India. Hello. Oh, isn't it quite late for you? Is it quite late for you? It must be quite late in the day for you. Thank you for joining and staying up. Okay, what other questions do we have? Okay, <laughs> yeah, let me cover this one. So PK Vlogs and Gaming, you're a fresher. What questions will they ask in the interview for Seller Support Associate? So one thing that you all need to understand is that the questions that get asked in your interview are entirely up to the interviewer to pick before the interview. There are no specific questions assigned to different job families. And there doesn't need to be because the purpose of the leadership principles is not to understand your skill set according to the job family. It's to understand your behaviors in the context of the leadership principles. So there is no need to align specific questions to specific job families. So I cannot possibly tell you what questions they will be asking you in a seller support associate role, because the only person that knows that is the person who's about to sit in the room with you and ask you that question. And they will probably only decide which questions they're going to ask you about five minutes before they enter the room. So you need to be prepared to cover the leadership principles. Now, your job description, and I talk about this almost every week, 
The leadership principles that they really, really care about can be found in the job description. It's all in there. But what you have to do is, first of all, understand the leadership principles really, really well. And of course, my course will help you do that should you choose to take it. First of all, you've got to understand them. And then once you understand them, you can go line by line through your job description and identify the type of language that is aligned to the leadership principle. And that will then give you very clear direction on the leadership principles they care about the most. If you would like a demonstration of how that can be done, please go to my storefront on my YouTube channel where there are two live sessions where I actually do that job description deconstruction live. People give me their job descriptions and I deconstruct them live. Haven't done one for a while. I might do one again in the new year, but there's two there. So please go check that out. And hopefully that will give you some good guidance on how you can work out what the key leadership principles are for your role. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Eric. Hey, so you have a bunch of work experiences that span multiple leadership principles. Is it acceptable to use the same example and expand on it based on the principle? So yes, I think that I've definitely got a video about repeating and I talk about repeating examples all the time in these sessions. So I'm going to summarize it up, which is yes, it is okay to repeat an example, but I urge people to, to uh, try and avoid repeating too many times. And that goes back to that whole concept of breadth. If you only use the same small number of examples repeatedly for different leadership principles, your panel are going to look at you and say, is this person a person that performs at a high standard consistently across their career? Or is this a person that has only done three or four really good things and has nothing else to talk about? And that's why these examples keep coming back because they don't want that latter person. They want the former person, someone that they can rely on as being a very, very consistent high performer. Now, Sometimes it is hard to do exactly unique examples for every single question. I know that's difficult. Uh, I can do it, but I've got like a 25 career history, particularly if you're more junior, it becomes very, very hard. So if you're going to repeat an example, as you're talking about here, you need to be able to spin it very differently for the different leadership principles that it shows uh, evidence of. So if you have an example that covers both dive deep and customer obsession, you need to come craft a way of articulating that story with that example that really, really biases towards all of the elements of customer obsession. If you stay until the end, Eric, I'm going to give you my free customer obsession masterclass and you'll be able to see exactly what I mean when I talk about all of the different elements of customer obsession. Then if you want to use it for dive deep, you need to reshape the story. So you're focusing on all of the elements of dive deep and you just skip over the customer obsession parts so that when you tell the story repeatedly to hopefully two different interviewers, when they capture it, it sounds like a very different story, even though the basis of it, the situation is common. Everything after that really needs to be different. So yes, you can use the same story. You can craft it for two different leadership principles. I actually recommend wherever possible, everybody tries and cra tries to craft one example in at least two different leadership principles so that they've got lots of potential stories that they can come forward. But I would suggest you don't repeat it too many times. If you're an L4 or an L5, it's much more acceptable to repeat more frequently. If you're kind of an L7, L8, repeats are a little bit of uh, repeats, material repeats are a concern. If it's L6, you're kind of somewhere in the middle. You can probably get away with two repeats, maybe even three. In fact, no, I won't say three for L6, that's wrong. If you're an L6, I, as a bar raiser, would be comfortable with hearing the same story twice, maybe at a push three times, not four. Okay, personal opinion, no laws and rules around it in Amazon, simply based on my experience. Okay, what other questions do we have here? Ah, oh yes, Ashu, you don't have data for your examples. So I definitely have a video on my YouTube channel that talks about what to do when you don't have any metrics. So please go and watch that in detail. 
I'll summarize up here for you, which is, it is usually possible to find some kind of expression of a data point that has gone from one place to another. So it doesn't have to be commercial metrics, sales, revenue, margin, it doesn't have to be that. It can be something like time to market reduced, number of people that need to work on a project reduced, um, error rates reduced, efficiencies increased. It can be any type of measurable kind of output of the work that you've done. So really go back to your example and ask yourself, what was my goal here? What was I trying to achieve? And if what you were trying to achieve was launch a product faster, then the metric that makes sense for this thing is to talk about the number of weeks it took from start to finish. The other thing to remember, Ashu, is no one's going to check. <laughs> so not that I'm telling you to lie, of course. I wouldn't do that. But no one's going to be able to check it. So as long as it's credible and as long as you've thought through all of the possible questions that an Amazonian might ask you about that data, upstream metrics and possibly downstream metrics, so that you are in a position to sound credible if they ask you follow-up questions on it, Nobody's going to know whether you um, were creative with coming up with those metrics. Don't tell anybody I said that. Moving on then. <laughs> there we go. Actually, Paul. Hello, Paul. Right. That's good timing. How does Amazon verify if the candidate is telling a real story or cooked up the story in the on-site interview? Um they can't empirically prove that you are telling the truth. But what I can definitely tell, tell you happens is when people are making up a story, if they aren't really good at it and they haven't really, really thought through all of the possible kind of little like offshoots and things like that and questions that could be asked as follow ups, they can trip themselves up, just little things here or there. And then what tends to happen is the individual interviewer kind of just gives them a pass because it's like, mm, that smells a bit odd, but you know what, I'll just ignore it and I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. But when everyone gets into debrief, everyone will have, or some people will have made a little comment here or there in that notes that something didn't smell quite right. And then when you see one, but then two, and then maybe even three, or people start to discuss it and other interviewers go, oh, hang on. Do you know what? I thought that too. I didn't bother writing it down, but I thought that too. It's that cumulative under, undercurrent of things that don't seem quite right that can then show that a candidate has obviously not been telling the full story or the you know, the accurate story. Now, Amazon knows that people are going to try and show themselves in the very best light. Fair enough. But what they, so, you know, so they give you a little bit of a pass on it. But when it then looks like someone has really, really stretched the truth too much at that point, red flags go up. So I will give you a specific example from when I was bar raising. I can't remember the role that I was bar raising on, but I met a candidate and given her resume, the narrative that she was telling me about the authority that she was given for decision making and the impact that her work was having at a scale point of view, I wasn't, you know, I kind of felt a bit suspicious. And then when we went into debrief, I noticed that one of my other interviewers, in fact, it wasn't even the interviewer, it was the shadower of the interviewer who actually had added notes, which doesn't always happen, also commented that they were a little bit suspicious about overclaim. And that then triggered a very, a quite an extensive conversation with all of the interviewers about how they felt about this concept of overclaim. And the more we kind of picked at it, the more interviewers were then able to identify elements of their interviews that they felt actually resonated quite strongly with that concern of overclaim and the candidate was not hired. So it is a fine line you have to walk in order to be able to present the narrative that you want to present to impress your interviewers whilst being sure, or at least as sure as you can be, that you won't trip yourself up in an interview and then cumulatively it to become quite apparent that you are making overclaim. It's a bit of an art form. 
That's why that's why mocks are so important, actually, Paul. Uh, you want to get in front of people who are you know, credible in terms of interviewing skills so that they can poke holes in what you're saying and ask you follow up questions so that if you are uh, being creative with the narrative, you know where the pinch points are and you can be prepared for those pinch points. I hope that helps. Oh, you see, it's a flaw in the process. Damn right it's a flaw in the process, but it's a flaw in every single process. Tell me a interview process where that isn't a flaw, other than interview processes that are purely based on kind of technical skills tests uh, where there's no subjectivity. And actually, there are they're not always technical skill sets that um, test that aren't subjective, right? Unless it's something like maths, Maths is what we say in the UK, math in the US, unless it's something like math where there is only one answer, pretty much many other technical tests, there are many different pathways to the right answer. And it's subjective as to whether the assessor believed you've taken the right pathway. So sure, it's a flaw in the process, but it's a flaw in interviewing as a concept overall. It's no worse at Amazon. The only difference being at Amazon and why I think Amazon is better is that you meet a bunch of people. So if you're only meeting one person, it's very easy to pull the wool over their eyes. But if you've met five, as I just described, and they all get in a room together and start talking about their experience, then it's when those things start to surface. So I would say flooring the process, yeah. Flooring interviewing as a concept, yeah. Mitigated more by Amazon than by most other organizations, definitely. Okay, what else do we have? Ah, Samesh, do I do resume re re reviews? No, I personally don't do resume reviews. I tell you why, they take a really long time. <laughs> so as much as I have looked at thousands and thousands, I mean, it's gotta be well over, I have to breach like 10,000 resumes and I'm not a recruiter, I'm just a hiring manager in this. So I've seen a lot of resumes. So skills wise, yes, I can do it, but I don't choose to because they take a very, very long time. But if you would like a resume review, there are people I trust that I can pass you on to. So contact me outside of uh, YouTube. If you'd like to do that, LinkedIn is probably the best place to mesh. Oh, Ashu, that's so sweet. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's kind. Mm. Okay, interesting question, Stephanie. How would I suggest thinking about questions about influence? Well, influence is earned trust. Right. That's all influence is and have backbone, disagree and commit. So how I suggest you think about them is about understanding the leadership principles of earn trust and have backbone, disagree and commit. And then use those as your framework for helping your interviewer understand the behaviors that you express in order to exert influence. Second point, then. And about frameworks for approaching ambiguity. OK, so ambiguity is covered off really in bias for action and uh, I'll write a lot. When you say frameworks, to me, that speaks to a particular structured methodology. And I'm not sure I have some kind of a acronym or something like that to share with you around that. But again, making judgments is what ambiguity is all about. And from an R right our right point of our right a lot point of view that's about making judgments based on your experience and just being able to know from your experience of the past or from your knowledge of other decisions made by other businesses what I call it gut but it's not gut it's informed instinct is what I call it in my leadership principle masterclass making a decision based on that or also going and finding somebody else who's way better at being able to make the decision than you are. And then from a bias for action point of view, it's about data. It's about the 80-20 rule on data and how you go about gathering enough data to be able to make the decision where the next 20% is disproportionate in terms of the amount of effort that you have to put into it in order to get that data. So overall, how you talk about the questions, 
about influence, earn trust, by, um, earn trust and have backbone, disagree and commit. Go and learn those leadership principles in depth. Ambiguity, go and learn our right a lot and bias fraction in depth. Every question you're asked can be brought back to a leadership principle. You just have to really understand the leadership principles. Okay. Ah, Ashu, you want a one-to-one -one before Friday? It's Wednesday today. I could fit you in tomorrow. If you go to the description of any of my videos on YouTube, there's a link there. Um, I've got like a 24 hour minimum um, lead time on a booking. So you'd literally have to go there now and book. I'm not sure if you'd even make it. Do you know what? Contact me outside of this and I will see what I can do for you. I do have a slot available tomorrow, but my booking system would lock you out now because it's less than 24 hours. So ping me on um, LinkedIn and I'll, I'll message you back. Okay, right. So, <laughs> right, so at this point, what time have we got? Okay, we've got seven minutes past. So one of the things I need you to do for me and uh, very kindly, Samesh has pointed it out to me is I need you to like this stream. There's only a few of us here today, so I'm not even sure whether I am actually going to uh, post this one on YouTube anyway, but assume that I will for now. And I need to plead with you, if you watch any of my videos, please, please do just give it a thumbs up, write a little comment. Thank you, Gigi, that was great. It makes a massive difference to the algorithm. It's a positive signal to the algorithm that my content is good. My content is good, but loads of trash seems to appear above me in the algorithm and I haven't really cracked why. So I need you to help me. So if you would just please right now, go and just do a little thumbs up for this stream. I do have a little video which I play, which amuses me greatly. I don't know if it'll amuse you, but I'm gonna play it anyway, just because I put the effort into creating it. So here's my little video to ask you to like the stream. Here we go. Like the stream. There we go. <laughs> That's my video. It's fun, right? No, or maybe not. So um, do you know what? I'm going to do another poll. I would love to know whether you hate that video because I spend so much time creating these things. I mean, they amuse me greatly. Don't get me wrong. But if you all hate it and you think I'm like completely insane, it would be useful to know. So here's my little video, my little poll for that. Let me know. Did you find my video fun or not? Would you wish that I would never do anything like that again because it's freaked you out? My children think it's horrifying. So thank you. If you have liked the stream, thank you very much. If you haven't liked the stream, um, why? Moving on. Moving on. Oh, yes, everyone likes my videos. <laughs> I'll go tell my children. I'll tell my children I have the data to prove that those videos are fun and not horrific. <laughs> you should see my kids put their heads in their hands every time I create a new one. All right. What else do we have? I'm going to close that poll then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, only on Gigi's channel, right? <laughs> Let's see what else we've got. Okay, 370 Kiran. So you've made it through two phone screens. You've got an updated for an SDM. Any suggestions on preparation and the writing exercise? So please go check out my video on the writing exercise and please go and check out my video with Vivek on SDM interviewing and SDMs in general. There's tons of advice in there for what you can expect in your Amazon interview for an SDM and what ground you should really be able to cover when you're talking about your examples. I'm not sure if we talk specifically about leadership principles for SDMs in that video, but go check it out. Okay. Moving on. Uh, I don't think I understand this question. So your loop was scheduled and out of the blue, they canceled the SDM. I don't know whether it means they canceled the interview or they canceled the role. However, the interview scheduled to happen after SDM happened anyway. What does this mean? 
are you rejected? HR are not replying. I don't understand the question, to be honest with you. So I can't say. Do you want to rephrase that? And we'll give it another go. Thank you. So I'm looking for other questions. Oh, everyone's having a chat on the thread. That's nice. I like it when people chat to each other on the thread. Oh, yeah, loads of chat going on. <laughs> loads of chat, loads of chat. I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling, trying to try and find other questions because you're all chatting with each other, which is good, right? Gigi's channel is about community. Okay, so let me try and get my head around this. Um, can I say that for me, a positive failure culture is important as a leader. I want to create an environment that allows people to try new things and fail, but I also know it's a sensitive topic. It's not really a sensitive topic. Amazon is an organization that is happy to fail, very happy to fail. You only have to look at all of the litany of failures in Amazon's history to know that. Fire phone, complete disaster. Dash buttons, ridiculous. Honestly, as soon as they launched those, I was like, oh my God, that is never going anywhere. Amazon restaurants, I could go on and on. So Amazon is absolutely a place where you can fail. It's about failing fast. You know, it's the whole kind of um, bias for action piece. So failing fast. And it's about um, our right a lot and making judgments. So it's not a problem to talk about wanting an environment where people can fail, but you also need to talk about the environment where people learn from those failures. Failure has no value other than if you learn from it. So that's really what I would say is the Amazon culture, failing fast and learning from it. So as long as you can pull those two things together, I think it would be well received by your interviewers. Ashu, you, you can find me on LinkedIn by just uh, searching for Gigi the Amazon interview whiz and uh, just send me a connection request and I'll connect with you. Okay, any other questions? All right, here we go. So Shweta, hello Shweta, how are you doing? So you're doing uh, interviewing for a data center delivery leader. What's the process? Please explain in detail. Okay, so I can't explain to you the, the process in detail because actually every single team runs their processes differently. There's a framework, but you can effectively pick from that framework as a hiring manager. So there are many different pathways the hiring manager could potentially go down. For um, a data center delivery leader is a technical role. So I would suspect that you will have an early round which would be very much focused on the technical nature of your skills. Uh, you may get some uh, behavioral questions in that. You may not, because quite often technical roles, they only focus on the technical in the first round. Then what can happen is you can just be passed straight through to loop and miss out the second stage of early rounds. What they might do is send you for a second early round where you will meet people and you will very probably at that round be very much focused on the leadership principles. Then if you pass that or if you've skipped that, you get to loop, panel, on-site, whatever you want to call it. it, has many different names. And again, from a technical role point of view, you'll very likely in your interview have to cover off both technical competencies as well as behaviors. So that's kind of the broad brush stroke, but every single team goes about it differently. I ran a marketing team. I always had two early phone screens before I took people to loop. There were colleagues of mine that didn't have two. They only had one because they were more relaxed about it than I was. So sorry, cannot know exactly what your team is planning. The only person that can tell you exactly what your team is planning is really the recruiter. So if you want to know detail what exactly the process is going to be for you in that particular role with that particular team, you need to go and ask your recruiter. Okay. All right. So I PK blogs and gaming are trying to re-articulate that to me, but I'm not sure I'm any clearer. So what do they expect from the candidate? Do they bother about communication skills or correct answers? Well, as I said, there's when it comes to behavioral interviews, there's no correct answers, right? It's not math. 
maths. So what they care about is whether you are able to demonstrate your behaviors in your previous career experience reflect what they're looking for in the leadership principles. Uh, communication skills speaks to a particular leadership principle, which is earn trust. Yes, every single interviewer is always looking for earn trust. It's a very critical leadership principle. Um, so hopefully that gives you some sense, but there's no kind of formula that says one plus three plus four plus nine plus tick equals inclined. Okay. Okay, right. So, okay, re-articulation. Your loop was scheduled and out of the blue, the HR canceled the one round with the SDM. Okay, maybe they couldn't make it. Maybe they were sick. Maybe they had an in, uh, another um, meeting that they just couldn't get out of and it clashed with their interview with you. However, the interview scheduled after the round with the SDM happened anyway. Right, am I rejected? No, HR isn't replying to your email. Okay, so someone just couldn't make your interview. That's it. It's as, it's as simple as that. So it's not that you've been rejected and the other people were able to make it. Great, bingo. So no, you're not rejected. Um, HR isn't replying to your email. That's to my point earlier. They're just ridiculously busy at the moment. But um, there's no correlation. There's no causal correlation. I love to, talking about causality and correlation with my children. Oh, mama. Um, there's no relationship between those two things. Okay, so does Amazon have any mechanism to verify the content of your CV? I'm not sure I like the way this is going, Paul. I feel like I'm a being a little bit conspiratorial with you here, um, but hey-ho, during background verification process, this can be a way to verify the data points from the CV or on-site interview. So all Amazon are going to do and are legally allowed to do in the majority of countries is find out whether you actually worked at a particular organization the roles that you had at that organization, the dates for those roles at that organization. And that's it. They can't know anything else. They can't ask anything else. They can't ask why you were left in the majority of countries, et cetera. So no, they don't do a deep interrogation of the people that you worked with on different projects that you talk about in your resume to find out whether the narrative and the data points that you gave were correct probably not legal in the majority of countries and would be super inefficient to have to do that for the many, many hundreds of thousands of people or be tens of thousands of people, I suppose, in any given period. Would you be hundreds of thousands? I don't know, maybe they recruit 100,000 people a year. Probably do, you know? So yeah, super inefficient and probably illegal. Okay. Next question then. What if you do really good in all rounds, but not good in the BR round, what would happen? Right, so the way that your data is assessed is in a pool. So yeah, you meet individual people. Yes, they do your interview and then take a view based on just the interview that they had with you as to whether they would choose to hire you or not. But once they've submitted their vote, they then get to see everybody else's vote and everybody else's data on you. They read it and then they go into the debrief. So they are then required to not just make their decision based on their particular experience with you, but they actually have to remake their decision based on this greater set of data that they now have access to. So it is very possible that you met with your bar raiser, they were unimpressed with you, they pressed the not inclined button after your interview with them. Then they saw everybody else's data and everybody else's data was brilliant or impressive enough so that when they have the conversation in debrief, they change their mind about their feelings about you because when they look at the data as a whole, it is compelling in a way that the data that they gathered on their own wasn't compelling. So you need to think about it like that. You know, it, it, the decision is made with data on aggregate. The de decision is not made based on individual interviews Inclined, 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 not inclined, not inclined, three out of two higher. Doesn't work like that. I hope that makes sense. Okay, what's the time? Oh, gosh, we're out of time now. And um, I need to go and feed my daughter. So let me just check and see if there's any more questions that you need me to answer. Oh, okay, yes, there's one question here, which is good. Oh, thank you, Flip B. That's sweet of you to say so. Thank you very much. 
Right, this is important, so I'm not going to skip this one. Hi, Gigi, in salary negotiation, do they ask about your current salary and do I really have to share this information? So the question won't be asked in countries where it's illegal to ask that question. Um, it's definitely illegal here in the UK. I think it's also illegal in places like Germany and other European countries. I think it's illegal in certain states in the US, but not in all states. I don't think it's illegal in places like India, for example. So depending on where you are, you may get asked that question. I, even if I was in one of those areas, would decline to answer that question because it's irrelevant what you earn at the moment. What is relevant is what you want to earn within reason. So if I was asked that question by a recruiter, I would say, actually, I would prefer not to share with you my current salary, but what I am happy to share with you is my view of what band, what range I would be expecting you to come back to me with if you were to offer me a role. Actually, so that's what I would say. Or the alternative is if you don't even want to give that away, because hopefully you've done your research, don't ever give that banding away without having done your research. The other alternative is to say, well, actually, I prefer not to share that information, but why don't you tell me the salary range that's available in this role, and I can let you know whether that's acceptable to me. I actually prefer that second one. And then if they won't give you that, then you can at least give them the first one that I shared with you. But yeah, don't ever give anybody your current salary. It's irrelevant. Okay. <laughs> oh, Samesh, will I take you to Big Ben when you visit London? You've always wanted to see that. It's very underwhelming, Big Ben, I have to tell you. There would be other places that I would choose to go in London, which, by the way, is the greatest city on the planet. It is. Uh, maybe Rome tops it a bit, but, you know. Uh, but, yeah, sure, Samesh, come to London. We'll meet up and I'll take you around the sites as long as there's... Uh, as no COVID issues, which there are here in London at the moment. Okay, right. So on that note, I'm afraid I am going to have to go. I need to feed my little daughter. But thank you very much for coming. I'm going to give you this freebie, which really you have to take. You have to take this. Go to AmazonInterviewWizAcademy.com. My free Customer Obsession Masterclass is on there. It's very good. <laughs> I break down customer obsession into its tiny component parts. I have a whole learning method for the leadership principles that nobody else has. I created it myself based on my deep, deep, deep understanding of the leadership principles. It's a smash hit with all of my candidates. So you find out my facets for the customer obsession leadership principle. It also tells you pretty much everything that they're looking for in customer obsession, literally everything they're looking for. And then there's a little mock interview of me interviewing me so that you can see how the whole thing comes together. Please go and take it. Uh, it is properly completely free. There won't be any follow up emails tomorrow if you go and get that today. And pretty much like 90% of you will be asked customer obsession in your interview process. So there is just no good reason not to take that out. So please, amazoninterviewwizacademy.com for your free leadership principle masterclass. All right, I'm going to go feed my little kid a doos. So thank you very much for joining. Uh, heading into Christmas, I know it's kind of the holidays. Sorry, again, English. Um, so it's quite quiet at the moment. So thank you for taking the time to come and, you know, making sure I didn't stay here talking to myself for an hour. Be safe, look after yourselves. And hopefully I will see you again next week. Bye bye.